Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus says. So Peter went over the side of the boat, walked on the water towards Jesus. But, shout but. When he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. And everyone shout, Amen. Lord, we give you thanks for this opportunity. Take broken flesh and work a miracle and bring a transformative word to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're joining us for the first time today, let me add my word of welcome to those that have already been spoken. And you're joining with us in the fifth week of a six-week series that we have called Unexpected Answers to Life Tough Questions. We've gathered a number of questions from the congregation and categorized them in the top six, and we've been talking about them. Uh, one question, for example, is, uh, why, does, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Or, how come the Lord is not answering my prayer? Or, how, am I, how can I be faithful in the midst of a toxic, painful relationship? Or, uh, talk to me, God, if you just tell me what to do, I'll do it. The subject being, how do I hear the voice of God? And if you missed any of those and some of those tough questions sounds interesting to you, go to our website, NBCCBayArea.com. You can pick up all of those messages. And you can also send them to various people that you think it will be helpful right there from the site. Today, I want to talk about another tough question. I'm really invested in this one. I, I was in L.A. this past weekend, and uh, I was scheduled to be preaching in L.A. today. But I had a leadership conference. I did the leadership conference, but a few weeks ago, we made the decision, and I just felt that it was right. I really needed to be back here. So I canceled the preaching engagement on Sunday so I could be here because I wanted to share this message with you that God has for you today. Praise God. So here's the subject. I want you to say this with me. How do I know I can trust God? That's what we want to think about. When we were building this category, a number of questions came to us. One question was, how do I know that God will save me and my loved ones? How can I trust him to do that? Or how can I trust God uh, that if I take a big leap of faith, how can I trust that he will catch me? Or can I really trust God to forgive me for all of my sins? Especially if I'm still sinning. Somebody else wrote, uh, how can I trust God with my broken heart? And I don't think I gathered this, this actually written out this way, but I know this is on a lot of our minds. How... Can I trust God in death when I die? Will he be there for me? Will that be the end of me? Or will, in fact, he transition me into eternal life? How, 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 how do I do that? And I said earlier today that if we can somehow figure out how to trust God in death, because we all going to die, that's for certain. If we can trust him in death, it's a lot easier to trust him in life. Because nothing in life is going to be more challenging than your dying. 
And so that's how we got to this passage today. And I just want to reflect on it. And uh, I want to challenge that when you go home, this passage really starts at verse 1, chapter 14. Very quickly, in order to understand what I've just read, let me give you the larger landscape. It opens up by saying that uh, Herod uh, has heard that Jesus is working all kinds of miracles. And he says, this must be John the Baptist who has risen from the dead. The reason why he says that is because... Uh, John the Baptist was a quintessential uh, giant figure of faith right next to Jesus. Even Jesus said about John the Baptist, uh, no greater one born of a woman than this man, John the Baptist, Matthew 11, 11. But the problem is that uh, a few weeks or months earlier, Herod had had John the Baptist killed, had him beheaded because John had challenged him about uh, he had been unlawfully married, and so he had him killed. And so when he heard that Jesus was doing these miracles, uh, he thought maybe John has been raised from the dead. But verse 13 is very significant, uh, which I didn't read. It says, as soon as Jesus heard about the death of John the Baptist, who was his first cousin, Jesus decided to get on a boat and go to a remote place because Jesus was totally broken behind. He was grieved behind. He lost John the Baptist. And of course, the rest of the passage talks about how when he gets to the remote place, it's no longer remote because tons of people discovered where he was going and they were there in droves. And he took compassion on them and he healed the sick. And then later on, he fed more than 5,000 people miraculously. And then finally, he was able to dismiss the people and he insisted that his disciples go to the other side of the lake so he could have some time in private prayer up in the hills. Now, what's important for you to get is that when the disciples head out to go to the other side, out of obedience, everybody say he insisted. So the, out of obedience, they begin to go to the other side of the lake and they run into a storm. And this is probably around maybe 4, 4.30 in the evening. And they are literally fighting for their life until about 3 o'clock in the morning. Trying to keep the boat from going under. Now what I think Matthew wants us to understand is that there are some legitimate questions here. If John the Baptist is a giant man of faith, how come God allowed his head to be cut off? And there are some legitimate questions for the disciples, right? John the Baptist is a disciple. All these folk are followers of Jesus, and they're all trusting and following Jesus. And so the disciples, they go out in the lake, and suddenly the storm comes, and they're fighting for their life, and Jesus is nowhere to be found. And so I'm sure the question is, where is Jesus? Why in the world did he send us out here to die? So the first point that rises from this insight is this point. <clears throat> Doubt is reasonable. Life will put you in some situations where your doubting is a reasonable response. I was with a friend uh, last, after I finished my leadership conference, husband and wife picked me up, took me to lunch, and she was sharing her story. It's a tough story. Uh, that they're faithful. They use their resources and all to serve the Lord. They've been serving God for decades. And all of a sudden, she woke up like the fellows in this boat in a storm. A storm came out of nowhere. She was diagnosed with cancer. And then before she knew it, she was, went from diagnosement, diagnosis to treatment. And then in the middle of the treatment, they said the treatment's not working, so now you're going to have to have surgery. And she went from one situation to the next. She was like the disciples. She was battling these waves. Yes, yes. And in that context, when your life is coming unglued, doubt is a reasonable response. But the second point it's equally true. Well, and, 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 and so what I want you to do, the first point is simply be able to acknowledge that doubt is a reasonable response. We have to acknowledge that. That's where we start. Everybody say acknowledge. 
But the second point is equally as true. If doubt is a reasonable response, then it is also true that we need to acknowledge that faith is a reasonable response to doubt. Now, let me make the point this way. When I got ready to get on the plane yesterday evening, about 8.05 last night, I walked onto the plane, and it's one of these small planes by Delta. I hate these kind of planes. <laughs> two narrow rows, just two rows. The roof is like way down here, and, and I'm claustrophobic, and then you feel every you know, feel like you're just waving and it's, it's horrible. This is the plane I got to get on. So I'm walking on the plane, right? And the lady greets me. She's smiling, nice and so great. And I look to the left and the door is open to the cockpit and the two pilots are sitting there. And suddenly I had a thought. I don't know who those guys are. As I started walking, you know how your mind started working, with you? So my mind started, I said, no, I don't know who they are. I don't know where they got license. I don't know whether they got drunk between the landing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know nothing about those guys, right? But the only practical option for me, they, despite that, I still go sit down in a seat, buckle up, and here these fellas, I don't know where they've been, I don't know who they are, I don't know where they got up on the wrong side of the bed, I don't know what they've been smoking, what they've been drinking, I don't know nothing, it's the unknown, come on. And yet, I, I, I have enough faith to allow them to take me 30,000 feet up in the air. Wow. Assuming they will land me in the proper place. This morning, about 3.15, I was driving here, because I came here, I come here early to do the final prep for this message, and I came to the intersection of Page Mill and El Camino in Palo Alto. Now, at about 3.15 in the morning, there was nobody there but me. But I come to the intersection multiple times during the course of the day, often at least once or twice during the course of the day. And during a regular work day, it's packed. You got cars going this way up El Camino, and then you got uh, a page mill, you're going this way. And you got a light on page mill and a light on El Camino. And so typically, I don't even think about it. I drive up, if the light is red, I stop. And the cars are going. And then when the light turns green, I move. I don't consider the fact that I don't know those other folk in those cars parked at the light. I don't know whether they're colorblind. And when the light says red, they might see green. I don't know whether they've been drinking. I don't know what, what kind of situation they got up in that morning and decided, you know what, I'm just not going to stop at any light. I, 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 just in faith, I just... Here's one for you. Some of y'all have been to the pharmacist. And you take a piece of paper that you can't read what's written on it the prescription right <laughs> and you turn it you give it to some folk dressed up in white coats you don't know where they are from they go behind a wall come on now they take poisonous stuff mix it up they come back put it in a bag and check your address and you go home and shake it and take it <laughs> here's my point right if we didn't live by faith day in and day out, we wouldn't leave our house. We would never exit. You'd never go to a restaurant because you don't know whether or not they done spit in your food. <laughs> Come on now, you'd never pick up anything from McDonald's. Come on. I mean, we live by faith day in and day out. If we didn't, come on now, uh, 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 we wouldn't leave our house. So if we're going to have faith in unknown folk, flying the plane and faith in unknown folks stopped at the light assuming they're going to stay there faith in unknown folk giving us medicine faith in unknown folk fixing our food then surely we ought to have faith in a known God who created the heavens and the earth and who wakes us up every day and sustains us on the way 
So for the person who says, you know, faith in the unknown is unreasonable, I'm here to tell you, oh no, faith is a reasonable response to doubt. Secondly, we need to function inside of this faith context with an eternal perspective on life. Everybody say eternal. What I mean by that is, I've shared this in other two guys, so I'll share it today. And my wife is here so she can vouch for me. That from time to time, and my, my nails, you can't tell now because my nails look horrible. But from time to time, I go to the place where you fix your nails. What do you call those places? Nail salon, nail shop, that's right. And I get a, a manicure, pedicure, what do you call that? Manicure, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and usually I go with Rhonda, my wife, or I go with my daughter, all right? But sometimes I'll go by myself. And one day I was there, I was thinking about this thought. You know, really, you know, if you look at this room, in one way it, it reflects eternity. It's fast. And if you think about my nail, it, it could represent your life in the vastness of eternity. And all of the calculations that have to be made in order for God to do what God wants to accomplish is far more than our minds can conceive. Let me give you an example. The guy who uh, plays Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the movie Selma is a friend of of, this, of one of the fellows that I was with yesterday and he told me that this guy whose name his first name is David I can't pronounce his last name but it starts with an O so I'm going to call him David O <laughs> so David O is a man of real faith he's a serious Christian and he shares in his testimonies here's what he says he says that a decade ago the Lord whispered to him that he would play Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A decade before, there wasn't even a movie, a script, or nothing. Think of all the things God had to do in order to bring that word to pass. Through all of the mistakes and the decisions and the missed appointments and the kept appointments that David O. went through, but because God said that it was going to happen, God knows how to keep his word. And in a decade, he didn't, he didn't know how long it was going to be, but it took a decade. But God worked through all of those decisions and mishaps and everything and brought his word to pass. Now, here is the insight. Listen, we don't know how God will use our lives in the scope of eternity. It's going to take him an eternity to work out some things. But the text says, his word says, all things will work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so I don't know. That means that, you know, that our death and our birth and our sickness and our health, we just don't know how he's going to use all of those things. But God is as good as his word. And if he says he's going to work it for our good, our task is to trust. If he could do that for David O., he certainly will do it for you and me in eternity. All right? Now, here's the deal. Just because you don't understand. I have this conversation with my daughter all the time. Just because you don't understand how God's going to work it out doesn't mean that God doesn't know how he's going to work it out. So do not limit God by the limitations of your mind. Because God, by definition, is more than what you can conceive. All right? So the first point is that it's, it's reasonable to doubt in these tough situations, but faith is a reasonable response to doubt. And we have to adopt an eternal perspective and allow God time to work it all out. Secondly, I think Matthew wants us to notice something, how he tells this story. You got the first story. John the Baptist is beheaded. And the question comes, where is the invisible God? At the same time, juxtaposed to that story, uh, Matthew is showing us Jesus, when he gets the news, he is broken hearted now you've got to remember that Jesus is fully human but he's also fully God he's God 
in human expression and he's broken hearted and as he tries to get away to tend to his broken heart around the loss of John the Baptist he runs into folk who need him and so he works miracles of healing and he works miracles of feeding and at the same time on the one hand I don't see the invisible God John the Baptist's head is cut off at the, on the other hand I see Jesus and he's grieving with the grieving and he's still working miracles of healing and feeding and when I recognize that when I see Jesus come on now I see God here is the teaching in the midst of your worst misery and mystery and you can't find God look for Jesus Somebody say, look for him where? Come on, ask it. <laughs> Two places. Number one, look for him in your past. Because this might be the first time you ever came to, you have ever come to church. It might be that you're not a Christian. It might be that you don't walk with Jesus. But here is some good news. Before you were in your mother's womb, you were already in God's will. And you may not have walked with Jesus, but Jesus has always been walking close to you. It's the God of grace. And wherever you find the unexplainable gifts of grace in your life, there is Jesus. Now, I think Matthew would say to those disciples who are out in the storm and they're wondering, is he able and does he care and where is he? That's the qu those are the questions we ask. Can we trust him, right? Is he able? Does he care? Can we trust him? I think Matthew would say, well, look, you skipped over chapter 8. Look back in the past. Look at chapter 8 and chapter 9. You guys was with him. Look, you were with him, Peter, when he showed up at your mama's house at your mother-in-law's house and she had a fever and he touched her the fever went away and she got up and served come on now all you guys was with him when there was a woman who was bleeding in chapter 9 with a with a blood issue for 12 years no healing no help but she managed to touch him and the healing dried up you were with him when they went up to a little girl's room that had died and he called her by name and she got up. Don't ask, does he care? He's shown you enough in the past that he cares. Don't ask, does he have the power? Just look back in the past. There are enough examples to say he's got the power. So if he's not here, he must be doing something on your behalf. All right, let me give you an example. A friend of mine told the story the other day. I thought it was powerful. He said to me that he grew up in the church. His father was a pastor and, uh, and all that. But when he got older, he realized that the church was full of broken people. By the way, did y'all know the church is full of broken people? <laughs> now, ask the person next to you. He said, do you know the church is full of broken people? Now, tell him, I'm not talking about you. Tell him, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> church full of broken people, including you including me, all right, full of broken people. And every now and then, broken people act like broken people. Right? And so he didn't understand that at the time, right? And so he just got upset, and he just left, and he doubted God. He said, I stopped believing in God. But this is a pretty funny thing. So he, said, so he said one day he was having an argument about whether or not God exists. The problem is he was arguing with God about whether or not God exists. <laughs> so he said, in the process... God illuminate and really the base of the argument is God if you exist you would be faithful if you exist you know I, I could depend on you if you would exist you know all these crazy people wouldn't be crazy you know come on and then came a revelation he remembered that when he was three years old a small town where he grew up in he got lost out in the fields and at three years old, he says he remembers the Lord whispering to him, go that way. He turned around and went that way. And when he exited the fields, he came out to an intersection. And at the time he came to the intersection, his mama was passing right at the same time. And then it struck him. If God was faithful when he was three years old and he didn't even know his own Come on now, address. The same God who was faithful in his past is faithful in his present. Uh, it's at work. 
So just look back over your life, baby. Find that time when you should have lost your mind. Find that time when you were in an accident and you should have died. The car was totaled, but you're still here. Find that time when, when you were considering taking your own life and you don't know how you got through that period of darkness. Find that time when you just wanted to give up, when you hurt so bad that you couldn't even imagine what tomorrow would bring. And then whenever you find that time, you're going to find some miraculous acts of grace. I know it because you're not there, you're here. And it is a proof that God was there. And wherever you find grace, that's Jesus. right there so you look in your past but then the other thing that's interesting about this passage that is very uh, unique about this passage listen it says watch this it says at 3 a.m. in the morning Jesus comes walking towards them on the water now Another way of making the point that I just made. Where was Jesus? Matthew would say from 4.30 to 3. We know where Jesus was. He was up in the hills praying. Felt dark on him praying alone. So here's the deal. Those boys should have been wiped out by the storm at 8. But it didn't. At 9 p.m., but it didn't. At 12 midnight, but it didn't. At 2 a.m., but it didn't. And here's some good news, I believe. Romans 8, 38 says this, that who can condemn us? It says, especially since Jesus died, yea, he rose from the grave, from the dead. And then it says, and he sits on the right hand of God and he makes intercession for us. And so here's the way I think about it. Listen, when God seems, when Jesus seems absent from your life, don't worry about it. He still has you in focus and he's just probably somewhere praying for you. And the way you've been able to sustain all of the stuff you've been going through is because his power is still at work in your life. I told my friend the other day when she, she said, look, she said she got cancer diagnosis. She went to treatment. Then they said they had to do surgery. And then she started back her treatment. And then they discovered that when they did the surgery, they cut two vessels they weren't supposed to cut. She had an emergency in the midnight, almost lost her life, had to rush her back to the hospital again. And she was like, what more can go wrong? This is what's going on with the disciples. Here they say, Jesus comes walking towards them, say towards, towards them uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning. They can't recognize, and the text says that when they see him walking on the water, they are terrified. It means they come unglued. And in their fear, they cry out, it's a ghost. In other words, I don't know what it is. There's a shadowy figure. What, what, what else is going to happen? Can't take it no more. Ah. And then the text says, it's a good word here, watch it. Then the text says, Jesus immediately sp spoke to them and said, don't be afraid. In other words, release your fear. Take courage, grab courage from within. That's where that courage came from. And the Holy Spirit puts it there. And he said, because I'm here. Everybody say, I'm here. Here's the lesson. What's the most frightening thing in your life? What is it that scares you the most? What, what is it that scares you so badly that you refuse to leave an abusive relationship? What is it about the future that afraid you so afraid that you won't leave that abusive relationship? What is it that is so frightening when you think about death? What is it that is so very frightening about it? What, what is it if you're struggling with disease right now uh, and you're thinking about uh, uh, next month and you're not sure whether you're going to make it or not? What's, 
What's the most frightening thing about that thought? Here's what I want you to know. Here's the most frightening thing for most of us usually is the fear of the unknown. The unknown. And what this text teaches us is that Jesus was coming towards them. Say towards. That means he was in, somehow he had gotten in front of them and coming back towards them. So I always like to say Jesus is not just with me, but he's ahead of me. And because he's ahead of me, watch it. He's in the mystery. He's in the unknown. That's why they call him a ghost. So the good news is, I know you're worried about the unknown. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the unknown, but I can make you assured of one fact, that Jesus is always in the unknown. The voice came out and said, I'm here. He's ahead of you. And he's made a provision of grace for whatever it is that you're going to face. We see it on the cross. The text says, for God proves his love for us that while we were yet sinners, he dies for us. Provision for our suffering. He was ahead of, suffered for us first on the cross. Provision for death. He died first. Provision for resurrection. He got up with all authority. Provision for forgiveness because it declares, uh, uh, let not your heart be troubled. But if you believe in me, if you believe in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And if it was not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you. He's made provisions. It doesn't mean he's going to always cut the storm off. But he's made a provision to make sure that the storm doesn't have the last word. It doesn't mean that the diagnosis is going to always come out the way we want it. But he's made a provision to make sure that whatever the end result of the diagnosis, it will not have the last word. Doesn't mean that the marriage is going to survive the divorce. But he's made a provision and he says, if you get close to me, come on now. The marriage can fall apart, but I'll hold you together. got enough grace for you if you trust him all right watch this everybody say make a decision before you access what he's done you've got to make a decision here it is in the text and you got to make a decision say i'm gonna engage him uh, uh i'm gonna obey him and i'm gonna i'm gonna learn to hear his voice and listen here it is in the text one of my favorite parts in the text listen so when peter hears jesus says i'm here Peter, I love him. I love him. He reminds me of me sometimes. He screams out in the, in the because of the winds are howling. So he, scree- he hollers. He said, the text says he calls to him. He said, he said, Lord, he said, if it's you, tell me. The Greek actually translates, command me to come to you walking on the water. In other words, if you really who you say you are, Not only can you walk on the water, but you ought to help me walk on the water. Come on now. And then Jesus said, watch it. Jesus didn't miss a beat. He said, yes, come. And I I can see Peter. Boy, this is what I love. I can see Peter. Peter said, he didn't miss a beat. He started putting the leg. In case you see those other disciples, said, man, what's wrong with you? Get back in here. Come on. Don't you see all that water? And they push him back and forth. And Peter said, no, no. And the text says he comes over the boat. Watch it. And he starts walking towards Jesus. One person says this. He was walking not on the water. He was walking on the word of God. Isn't that the powerful thing? That's, that's why I want to encourage you. You've got to keep reading the word of God. You've got to come become familiar with the Bible. Start in the gospel of John. Just take your time and work your way through. Because why? Because faith comes by hearing and faith comes by experiencing what God has done in the history of his people. When you read the Bible, you'll discover that he's a God who makes a way out of no way. Because when the Red Sea wouldn't open up, he made a way out of no way. Come on. When you read the Bible, you'll discover that he's with you in the wilderness of your life and he'll be bread for the hunger, hungry and water for the thirsty. When you read the Bible, you'll discover that, come on now, he can heal the sick and raise the dead and conquer death. 
and, 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 and triumph in resurrection. When you read the Bible, you will discover it's talking about your story. And you'll discover that he's not only who he says he is. You will discover when you read the Bible, you are who he says you are. When it says you're more than a conqueror, come on, you are who he says you are. When he says you're forgiven, you are who he says that you are. When it says you can do all things through Christ, you are who he says you are. Walk on the word, baby. Walk on the word. Walk on the word. Tell somebody, walk on the word. You never know it until you try to be obedient. There's a part of trust in God that only comes into focus as you try to obey. It's powerful. Here's the last part. When Jesus, Peter's out there, and then all of a sudden it dawns on him. I'm on the water. And there's a storm. You see that wind? I'm running the waves. And he's like, am I crazy? And he is terrified, the text says. And he starts to seek. I love this. He starts to seek. And he knows what to do. He, says, he prays a one-sentence prayer. Watch it. He says, his, his the only prayer he prays as he goes out. He says, Lord, save me. And the text says, that's his scream. Lord, save me. Come on, practice it. Lord, save me. When you feel like you're going down, when you feel like there's nobody there to catch you, when you feel like you're all by yourself, when you feel like you're out to count, I just want to teach you that one word prayer. Lord, save me. Come on now. I'm not asking for the president. I'm not asking for my wife. I'm not asking for the rich person. There's only one person that can save me. When you're thinking about death, come on now. There's one person that I hope to see when I close my eyes and I'm going to call him, Lord, save me me text says he reaches down Jesus doesn't miss a beat he doesn't debate it he doesn't say how much you got he just reaches down and grabs him then we misinterpret this other part watch it he then says uh, uh, you have so little faith we think it's a scolding it's more of a correction, but watch it. It is a, it is a, it's a compliment turned inside out. Watch it. I'm going to come back in a minute. He said, you have so many faith. Why? So little faith. Why did you doubt me? Jesus says, doubt me, him. All right? Now watch this. It was a compliment, y'all. He said, you have so little faith. Watch his teaching here. If Peter did have so little faith, but it was enough faith for him to get out of the boat. Everybody else stayed. It was enough faith. His so little faith, watch it, was enough faith for him to walk towards Jesus. Come on now. It was enough faith to get him close enough that when he started to sink, he could cry out and he was right there and Jesus reached out and grabbed him. Come on now. So the teaching of the text is you don't need a whole lot of faith. You don't need the faith of Hamilton. You don't need the faith of Moses. You don't need the faith of Abraham. Just have enough faith. Take your little faith. Come on now. Your so little faith and aim it towards Jesus. Just takes a little faith. A little faith. And then here's my last point. Believe the good news. The text says, the text says he grabbed him and it says when they got in the boat, the storm stopped. I wish I had more time, I'd work with that. (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes God will allow a storm because that's the only way to get your attention. Uh, Sometimes he will allow a storm because that's the only way to remove all of your dependencies to to help you to understand that there's no greater dependency in life but Jesus himself. And when you grab him, the storm. 
good God, about I got to finish. I'm over time. All right, all right. And then, and then watch what the text says. Watch it, watch it. And suddenly, these boys who had been with him for three years, suddenly it says they believed the good news because they, they worshiped him. And they said, they fell out on their knees in the boat. And they said, you know what, Jesus? You really are the Son of God. You really are God in flesh. You really are God at my address. You really are God who's able and God who cares and God who's with me. And they worship them. Oh, oh, praise him. You know what the good news is? There's only one place in the universe where there is proof that you can trust the invisible God. That you can trust that he loves you. And that you can trust that he will do anything to save you. There's only one place in the universe. And it is Paul who says it. For God proves, say proves, proves his love for us. That while we were still at our worst, Christ died for us. Conquered death and is now the triumphant king. Shout hallelujah. Say thank you, Jesus.